Welcome to the 2021 Sunstone Symposium Session 211, The Importance of Visual Literacy in Dissecting the LDS Faith. At Sunstone, we are making it a goal to build a community that allows many ways for people to express their faith. Our tagline is, there is more than one way to Mormon. We invite you to help us to build a community where all paths are given space to be understood. Please support us in our mission by making a donation and subscribing at sunstone.org. After the symposium, the Sunstone staff will edit, polish, and re-upload all of this year's session videos to the Whova app. It will take about two weeks for everything to be available, but once it is, every video will be available to watch and re-watch on the Whova app until the end of 2021. Please type any questions that you have for the session in the Whova app to be addressed during the Q&A period at the end. This session will discuss the visual storytelling used by the LDS Church in their commissioned works of art by dissecting the church's standard practices and uses from an artistic and cognitive position. We will decode the history and storytelling of LDS art. I will take a second to introduce you to our speakers before we begin. Juniper Finley is a collaborative artist and published model. She has 13 years of experience as a performing artist and eight years of experience as a visual director. Kurt Westwood is a cognitive communications consultant and strategic storyteller, co-founder and CEO of Glass River Media and best-selling author for his book, The Very Best Bad Idea, which dissects human cognition and creativity. I will now give the floor to our presenters. Awesome. Good morning to everyone. Yes, good morning. Awesome. So, uh, you know, as uh, I just want to say up front, you know, we were just talking, uh, Juniper and I are really, really excited to be here. We've been working together for a while now. And uh, this is a, as, as a, as a thing that is very important to both of us, just an understanding of visual literacy, art, and the way that stories and pictures specifically can affect us heart, mind, and soul, and, and their ability to really change the narrative and change how we feel about a situation just in the visuals of it. So what's first and foremost important to understand is exactly what visual literacy as an is. So for me, visual literacy is not something that I became very aware of until I was in art school. Now, it is something that is a skill that just about everyone has. What visual literacy is, is the process of being able to look, analyze, and respond to an image. That response could be emotional, it can be intellectual, it could be, it could show up as a thought, a feeling, maybe even a decision that you come to after looking at a visual image. Um, being able to look at your social media feed and looking at an image, you're going to see and identify uh, symbols, memes, pictures from your friends, and you are going to compare those images to the wealth of knowledge you already have in your mind. And that's going to lead to a response. Again, whether or not that's just an emotional, intellectual thought or a feeling, that that's the way that the visual literacy comes through. When we are talking about visual literacy as an academic practice, we are looking at art or any visual image and being able to break it down into what it actually means in the context of the time period, the medium, the composition, all of these other things. Pictures are an act of storytelling. So Kirk's gonna tell you a little bit more about uh, photo, photo <clears throat> journalism. So to start about, when we start talking about art history, it actually really helps to start where we are because it's the easiest thing to understand right now. It's the easiest thing to understand the world in which you understand. We can jump back to the you know, Byzantine art and thousands of years ago, but that already takes this huge cognitive leap. So it's best if we start with images we've seen and images that are much more contemporary to us. So I wanna talk a little bit about photojournalism as an act of storytelling. Now, whether or not you know that this is the picture of Iwo Jima uh, doesn't actually matter. And whether or not you know about the controversy of whether or not this picture was staged doesn't actually matter. And whether or not you know those are Marines and this is the South Pacific and this is World War II, lots of, there's lots of details and context you could know that add to it, but without any of it, this is a picture of a victory. It's a picture that is 
you see the destruction, you see the hoisting of the flag, you see the teamwork. This is a picture that tells a story in so much as it won the Pulitzer Prize for being a great work that culminated this great battle. Now, whether or not you knew that Carol Guzzi was in a refugee camp in Albania during the Kosovo crisis in this picture, it doesn't matter. As a father, as a mother, as a sister, as a brother, as a human being, seeing a child passed through barbed wire, you don't need to know where those mountains are. You don't need to understand the context. The context certainly helps, but this picture evokes an emotional reaction independent of its context. Just the content brings you to a place of common understanding. This is not a happy moment for a parent. <laughs> You don't need to know why there's barbed wire or why the, why the child is being passed through it. It's important because we have an emotional reaction to it. It tells a story without the need for context. Next, we don't need to know that this was in 2017 and the riots in Ferguson. Lots of us do because this is very contemporary. Most of us remember this picture circling the internet and circling the web. There's so much motion. There's so much emotion. There are so many questions to be asked. Given the context of it, we can start to dissect what was really going on here. Who is this individual? Why is this happening? We can start, once we start adding context to it, what was going on in Ferguson and what, uh, what the surrounding narrative was, we can start to add depth. But as it is, this picture asks many questions. What's about to happen? What did just happen? And it's important to understand that a lot of that happens in our limbic system completely independent of our uh, uh, us doing it actively. It just happens passively in our uh, behind the scenes. Yeah, something to, to pay attention here is that our visual literacy skills come through whether we're we are actively accessing them or not. So when we are aware of how images are affecting us, we are in more, we're more in control of how we want to respond to them. Living as a slave to this process of looking and responding is, is not where we want to be. We want to be able to use these visual literacy skills as a tool to develop our minds and be cognitively aware of how images shape our minds and our perception of truth. So in terms of photorealism, what we are looking at is what happened and being able to understand the context of where these things came from and what they mean to us is of the utmost importance. And now I wanna piggyback on that before I get to my next image. So a lot of this has to do with personal skill, personal awareness and, and understanding. But because we recognize as photojournalists in this part of the presentation that, that we're talking to the broadest possible audience and not everyone is going to be able to have that visual literacy. And a lot of people are going to take the context they are given and just run with it. And when I say a lot of people, I actually mean most. Most people are going to see a picture, be told what's happening and not dig deeper because that's just what we do. It's just something that is inherent to, to us as a species, not even a culture. Why that's important in photojournalism is this next picture. This man was a Pulitzer Prize winning photo, uh, photographer and he was fired after he admitted that he doctored this picture uh, uh, of a Syrian war rebel. Now, if you pay close attention, and I understand that we're all looking at computer screens and it's really hard to see anyway, so I would encourage you all to Google this, but what he's removed out of that bottom left quadrant is an out of focus, hard to see camera. It was his camera. He had left it on the ground and when he framed up this picture and took the, and took the snapshot, he captured this image that he really, really liked, but it included him in the story and he didn't like that. So he didn't change the Syrian story. He didn't, add, he didn't change the rose to a gun or do anything really, really negative. He just removed himself from the narrative. He felt that that was an accurate and adequate uh, change. And as such, he was fired. He was blackballed from the Associated Press and Reuters and he will probably never work in the same capacity uh, as he did before because whether or not you feel it's appropriate, editing reality when presented as reality is unethical. And you were like, now for the record, I wanna be really clear. I'm on the other side of this one. I think he made it a better picture. I think he told a more compelling, more honest story, but I don't get that vote. He changed reality. He altered the reality for the viewer. He removed himself from it and that's not what actually happened. Now, was the picture just as good with the camera? I also say yes, he should have just left it in. 
But the point is, is that we as a society currently, and specifically in visual storytellers in current methodologies, we understand that any alterations beyond color and cropping, and even sometimes cropping, that any alterations to the narrative are unethical. They alter the limbic system. They alter our ability to perceive what was going on. And any man-made alterations to that from a photojournalist standpoint is unethical. But as we start to go into art history, obviously we're not gonna be talking about photojournalism, but our brains don't always recognize the differences with the same nuance that our rational minds do. Yes, so it is, it's important to also remember that uh, in art history, painting was sort of this very first written language. It's the very first pictorial language, being able to put down an image and it means something and tell a story. So uh, when we think about the oldest biblical narrative we have, it's Genesis. So the Garden of Eden, uh, we're gonna look at several different versions and interpretations of the narrative. Now, as we're looking at this, we immediately realize that this is not a photo. This is not a very uh, point blank way of depicting a singular moment. What we're seeing here is a narrative. Um, we, as, as we look at doctrine, we know that as when Eve was being tempted, we're looking at temptation here. We see Satan here. He's sort of this man meets serpent and she's partaking of the fruit while at the same time Adam is pictured. Now we know biblically that Adam was not there. We probably also can bet that there weren't this many animals around, but what we're trying to do is create an image that is full of symbols and can be able to capture an entire narrative in one singular canvas. Um, next, we're gonna see another very similar image, but we see that some things are different. The way that the adversary is pictured, the way that nudity is used, um, we, we see many different ways of showing this narrative. Um, when it comes to dissecting and understanding and reading these images, we can remember that in the Middle Ages, likely, um, go ahead and go to the next image, actually, I'm sorry. sorry. This, this is an image by Michelangelo. And what we are seeing here is very much the entire story. We're not just focused on temptation. We're not just focused on being cast out. This is showing the entire story all in one panel. And there are symbols, there is twisting and turning and changes happening. And all of this comes together to tell a general story. None of this is necessarily, I mean, perhaps it is exactly the way that it happened, but what's more likely is that this is Michelangelo's interpretation of the work itself. So understanding that where these paintings are coming from is the exact same place that you would go to find the information for yourself. <clears throat> So here in this very next one, this is an even more, um, a, a little bit more different than the other ones because the other ones we're seeing, okay, we're, we're having a general understanding of perspective and light and things like this. This image tends to take a much more symbolic route. Um, we, we see the symbols, we are recognizing gestures, and we are also seeing dinosaurs and other and alligators and other animals, and none of them are fitting into the space the way that they are meant to, or as we would understand them to be. And I think that even in this image, even though it may not be the most uh, photorealistic, it also tells more of the story than any of the others. Um, so interpretation and representation, understanding what is being represented, looking, dissecting it, and recognizing that art is a response. Art is a response to something else, and understanding what that something else is, is going to lead you down the path of being able to understand the image fully. So I want to jump in here and talk a little bit about certain images in this, uh, in this picture particularly that aren't quite right. So if you look at that top left, uh, there is a, there's an angel. It's a beautiful angel. Um, and, you know, I would assume that it's in some representation of the seraphim and the flaming sword that was left to, to guard, guard the garden. Here's some problems with that. Now, as we've talked a little bit, art throughout history 
lots of people, those pictures, like the one with Michelangelo and these pictures from the middle and the dark ages, those would have been their, they couldn't read statistically and historically. So that would have been their only firsthand interpretation of that event. Now this picture is from the 20th century. So I'm not talking about this one in particular, but throughout history, many of these pictures of the garden that would have been someone's only interpretation. So as they see angel, as they go to then do their own art, they then recreate the angel. But the problem is it doesn't say angel, it says seraphim. A seraphim is the plural of seraph. A seraph as it is described in Isaiah and several other different places is six winged and frankly terrifying. If uh, we didn't have time to uh, build it into this presentation, but if you Google seraphim, Actual, descript, uh, actual depiction, they were covered in eyes, they had six, six wings, they were not beautiful creatures, at least not as we in the modern mind think of beauty. So in, in this particular painting, they've shown an actual seraph a little bit closer, still not 100% right, but still a little closer to the, the actual biblical description. We don't see this much because in the day, we can assume that priests were just saying an angel and a flaming sword. People couldn't read Isaiah themselves to see that seraphs were angels, but they didn't look like men with wings. J. Kirk Richards is one of my absolute favorite LDS painters, and he has done a depiction here where it got seraphs wrong. These are just beautiful angels without wings entirely, and they are gorgeous and serene, but it at least got the plural, plural correct because seraphim is, in fact, as I said, plural. So J. Kirk Richards here is another depiction where it is at least plural seraphs with the flaming sword, but all of these things are interpretations that are, are different than the description. Now, we'll say this several different times, but I want to take a moment now to say it again. Interpreting is fine. There is nothing wrong. There's no need to be pedantic and go, well, that is not correct. It's supposed to be two wings covering their eyes, two wings coming from their arms, and two wings coming from their ankles, which is true, by the way. Like, it, 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 it isn't about being pedantic or precise. I understand. We both understand that this isn't photojournalism, but it is important to understand that what the artist is sending is, in fact, always different than reality. It is always an interpretation of something, and therefore it needs to be taken by that on reception. And lots of us understand that rationally. We get it. We understand, like, of course, Kirk, it's a picture. I get that. But here's the problem. When you go and see a Jason Statham movie or any other action-packed movie, your heart races during the action scenes. And during your favorite romance scenes, your heart flutters. And there's a reason for that. Because whereas your rational mind understands you're watching a movie, your limbic system doesn't your emotional response specifically to images is passive. It's, it's inherent and it's automatic. So whereas we can rationally understand that we're looking at a painting, with, if something is said, see dog, say dog, if we say that's a dog and we point at it and we, that's a dog and we point at it, even if we later read a description of a dog that is remarkably different, we saw a mastiff and see a chihuahua described, it almost doesn't matter that our rational mind understands the difference. It's remarkably important that our core system saw and responded to images far greater than it did to, uh, to text, which gets really, really important as we move forward. So these next images we're going to be looking at move out of the Garden of Eden and into the Garden of Gethsemane. We are going to be discussing color and light. And as we look at this first image, let's just notice what hits you first. Artists are trained to use color and light to create mood and depict a story, to, to make a connection, to talk to you. And in this image, we see Christ in Gethsemane surrounded by beautiful greens and blues, bright white light shining down on his face as he looks up and speaks to God the Father. At this moment, he is pleading for him to remove this cup, but if he must, he will. And biblically, we know that it was the middle of the night. So even still that first image doesn't feel like quite the story of what was actually happening. So when we're looking at these, these images of Christ, the very next one actually is a callback to art history in um, this very next one where we actually see his head glowing. That was, that was a sign in art history of a divine being is, is putting this sort of halo around the head. And we see this 
man who is stalwart. He is glorified. He is meek and mild, and he is having a conversation with his father. But then so, we read here. So, this is a, a triumphant. I mean, a triumphant might be a little strong. This is a serene man, a strong man talking to his father. But as it is described in both Matthew and Mark, Luke doesn't mention it, but it goes on. He says, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, it is possible. May this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So it probably didn't look like this or the picture in green, the first one that we've seen a million times uh, in every LDS chapel and in every, uh, in every church talk. It probably looked a little bit more like this or even or even this see we've all heard the story i'm not saying that we've we've left the narrative out that he sweat as with great drops of blood we know that phrase we've heard it but in the lds liter uh visual canon it's never depicted even these last two pictures uh which may or may not be by lds uh artists they are not within the lds canon you can't go to the lds uh library and and pick them up to teach your lesson on a Sunday to, to course 15 or course 16. These are not the visual canon. Um, this is, this is the visual canon. And that's fine. Artist interpretation is good and it's, it's, it's right. This is still a picture of the atonement in many, many ways. But as we are told, and we give people this, this benchmark, as I said earlier, sea dog and say dog, as we talk about the Gethsemane, and we can describe it with the blood, and we can describe it with the spell on his face, and we can describe it emotionally, but every time we hand out a picture or, or uh, use one of those art boards in class and put up a picture, it's that picture by Harry Anderson in greens with a serene and relaxed savior, which, as I've said a few times, from a cognitive and limbic system does not actually give us that correct response. Now, when we were talking at the beginning, we were talking the Garden of Eden, and that is used by every Abrahamic faith. Islam uses the Garden of Eden, Jude uh, Judaism uses the Garden of Eden, Christianity uses the Garden of Eden. So we have had thousands of years of hundreds of different peoples and continents, many different art movements that have been encouraged uh, to take thousands of images through the aggregate and we get the symbols. We get it, we get there very quickly because we understand they are symbols because we've seen so many variations, it encourages us to fill in the blanks for ourselves. When we move to the Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> let's try that again. When we move into the Garden of Gethsemane, we have obviously chopped out two thirds of that narrative. Now we are only talking Christianity. And whereas there are absolutely other faiths that have done renditions of the great drops of blood and there are other faiths that have done these things, the church hasn't. There has been a very, the, the, the depictions chosen by the church have been remarkably singular in the serene Christ, the strong Christ, the pleading Christ, not the anguished Christ. That is not an image that the church has commissioned or allowed in its visual literacy, in its visual canon. And whereas there's nothing wrong with that, it's important to recognize. I think when we're looking at the Garden of Eden compared to these images of the Garden of Gethsemane, it's we went from looking at a full story to only a fraction of what happened and or what that happening meant. I think what we're really looking at in those first few photos is the church's focus on the atonement, the focus on the end result rather than the other artists' renditions where that are that are not recognized or uh, spread by the church are these images of Christ face down, like in, in these moments of suffering. And I think that it is important to also understand that when you look at an image, it is a shortcut to an entire um, a picture is worth a thousand words is what I'm trying to say. When you look at an image and you look at it in conjunction with certain lessons, certain scriptures, and those are regimented and, and delivered to you on a weekly, yearly basis, those reminders are going to create shortcuts in your mind so that when you see those images, you are automatically thinking X, Y, and Z. And where that becomes really important is when we start using these pictures to actually depict a historical narrative. And we're doing that with some degree of intent, like I'll show in this next picture. Now, we have all, I'm going to assume everyone here at Sunstone has seen this picture and has heard the first vision, but I'm going to share the first paragraph again, just so we're all on the same page. 
Joseph Smith's words that are in the introduction say, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. Now, why this is particularly interesting is much like seraphs and seraphim and much like uh, many different art things, uh, those beings aren't exactly over his head and, and, and neither are those. And, and, and those are a little closer and, and neither are those. And again, artist renditions are fine, but unlike the Garden of, Gis uh, Garden of Eden, where we had so many different interpretations that allowed for lots of gray area and understanding and perspective, and the Garden of Gethsemane that has a few more, but still less, now we're talking about a single organization controlling the narrative of the historical depictions of this event. And literally none of them that I could find, that I could find, depicted it in any way representative as Joseph Smith described it. Now, is that a problem? You tell me. Artist renditions are fine, commissions are fine, curations are fine, I work in PR. Controlling your own story through visuals is fine. You all do it on Facebook. You all do it on Instagram. We control our narrative through visuals. We do that. But when we eliminate the opportunity or the ability to depict it as it is actually described, many people I know personally view these pictures that are commissioned by the church as scripture. They see these pictures as holy writ. So the question is, we have all of these pictures that depict something that is not in keeping with the actual written word. And that starts to create cognitive dissonance. And that starts to create a real problem, whether or not we actively recognize it, whether we're like, no, no, I get it. You're right. Your rational mind does get it. But we have eliminated, we are now controlling the narrative with this visual, sea dog, say dog, this is what it looked like. But when we go and read the text, almost none of these pictures depict that he was attacked by the adversary just prior to this. None of them depict that they were exactly over his head. So in my head, he was always laying on his back. He, would, he had fallen to his ground and they were literally in the trees above him. We have so many different ways to interpret this situation and none of the artistic renderings commissioned by the church depict it in any other way than this one. So are we to believe, are we to accept that on faith, which I know many people that do? Well, yes, these are scripture. These are the actual, these are the inspired understanding of how it looked, or are these just a commissioned understanding that is meant to elicit an immediate understandable, because a kid laying on his back with people, with, uh, with the Savior and the Father standing sideways above him, that's harder to get. It's not as visually appealing. We've made a picture that is quicker to understand, but less accurate. Is that a problem? You tell me, but we'll get into it a little bit more as we move forward. I think um, what another point that can be made here is that painting, while it has become this thing of, of creative expression and seemingly can do things that photography can't do, it's important to remember that when the church began and when they began commissioning works, photography wasn't around to capture these moments. So when they are commissioning things that, that are historical claims, we should be seeing a much clearer picture so that we can understand exactly what has happened. Because as we read, we are meant to be looking at these images. I'm, I'm coming back to this Sunday school sort of approach of your teacher reads the lesson plan, goes to the library, picks up the images, puts them out in front of you, and you read scripture while looking at these images, cultivating that, uh, that mind map just from here, point A, B, C, D. Now I can, I've done this so many times that when I look at this image, I am automatically already affected heavily by my testimony and the things that I have built and, and learned for myself about this image. And I mean, to just to piggyback on that, we have the LDS MPS as well, the Latter-day Saint Motion Picture Studio that does all the CES videos, that does legacy and journey and testaments and all of those different things where you want to talk about the if you want to talk about just the the uh, the photos and the the paintings, add music and motion to that, and we are now playing with a full deck of 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 tools that allow for unbelievable communication. And I don't want any of this to sound nefarious unduly, but we have multiple uh, vi uh, videos of the first vision and of the Garden of Gethsemane, and some of them do 
uh, deviate from what we're saying slightly, but they all still depict this very controlled narrative that do not allow for much variation of what happened. Add that to an organization that claim that 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 is professing prophecy, that is professing it, uh, all things being inspired. Are we to take these? Are we to take these as scripture, if they were commissioned by the church, or are we to take them as literally as Michelangelo's uh, rendering of leaving the garden, which in many ways was a three cell comic? We had multiple stages of the story in a single image. One of them we kind of get. Oh no, that was an artist rendering, but. As church members, we tend to take things released by the church with a lot more weight. And the question is, should we? Are, is the art from the church different than art from Michelangelo? Yeah, and, and the, the, my point and my, um, my stance here, I want to be abundantly clear, is that this is not a question about your faith. Asking questions about the images you're looking at is you using your free will to think critically and dissect things that were made by man. Things that were made after looking at the same exact scripture that you read for yourself. So in terms of what it means to question your faith, this is more of a question of what am I looking at? It's not about my faith at this point. This is about just my relationship with an image and what it means to break that down and to add it to what perhaps I am feeling or thinking or have developed for myself. Awesome. So as, we, as we're gonna move into this next thing, I wanna just kind of reiterate. So I work in PR, that is what I do. I help organizations curate their story through images. Now, a word that uh, has a lot of negative connotations to that. And so I don't, you know, don't anyone get carried away with this word I'm going to use, but this is what the entire premise of propaganda. Propaganda, the root word there is to propagate, to spread an idea. Now, again, due to World War II and other things, it has a very negative connotation, but the root word of propaganda is just to propagate an idea, to seed a mentality. It's, I've said it three times now, see dog, say dog. If I want you to dislike a people, I can do that through images and words repetitive through different stages of your cognitive cycle. If I want you to think something is good, I can do the same thing through pictures, images, words through different stages of your cognitive cycle. We can build, as Juniper said, that mind map. We can create a holistic picture that allows, that allows for a lot of things. And again, none of this is nefarious. Every advertiser you've ever heard of does this. You do this on Facebook on Instagram with your mother, with your yearly holiday card. Curation as an act of storytelling and creating the image and the brand you want for your family, for your life, for yourself is inherent and is not nefarious. However, when we start to be an organization that is using pictures to depict a historical event, we have to start asking some very important questions which brings us to our next section. We have all, it is said in the first few pages of the Book of Mormon that the Book of Mormon is the most true, is the tr most true book more than any other book. And the brethren will, you know, that we will live better if we live by its precepts than any other book in the world. I butchered that quote, but I think you all know what I was referencing. And for over 200 years, in multiple uh, videos put out by the church, in Enzen covers, in, in many different uh, iterations, we've created this mind map, Joseph Smith by candlelight, sometimes across from Oliver Cowdery, sometimes not, sometimes behind a veil, sometimes not, but always pensively studying the scriptures, the, the gold plates which sat out before him. It was a heroic moment that in many ways evokes the same imagery as Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence. It was strong, it was heroic, it was this moment of great, great uh, stewardship. The problem is, is, as I think many of you already know, that's not how the translation happened. The way that I was raised believing, uh, being taught all about it was, was with, with, a, with a breastplate and a bow and the Urim and Thummim. As has kind of come out, I, I'd heard of it as a child, but has come out a little bit more forefront more recently, is with the seer stone in the hat. Now, as M. Russell Nelson talked about it a few years ago, and yes, there were multiple different methods. And does it matter how he did it? No, it actually doesn't. I'm not here to debate whether the methods of translation are at play here. I, that, that's not the purpose here. 
And does it matter that we never depict the the uh, the uh, the breastplate in the Urmanthamum? Not really. Does it matter that there are not many pictures of the the hat and the seer stone? There are some more recently because of it's come more to the forefront, but they are still not through the LDS canon. Like through, uh, you can't go to the church library and pick it up to teach your lesson. The question is here is not whether or not um, this is how he uh, translated the Book of Mormon, because we know through his own accounts it is not the only way or the only thing that happened. It'd be, it would be really easy to say, and I've heard it said, that, well, you, clearly, the, you're saying this, mo th this moment clearly happened. This is, this is a depiction of one of the moments, not all of the moments, and that's fine. That's absolutely fine, and I agree with that. But when over 200 years, an organization only releases a single image depicted in very, very, very similar ways, we can say, well, they never said that he didn't use the rock in the hat, or we never said he didn't do these other things. We teach that in the written word. We teach that. The question we have to ask ourselves is, why is the only visual that is being commissioned, curated, released, and, and championed by the church, why is the only visual this one that is fairly inaccurate, or if not inaccurate, very incomplete? In the word, again, I don't mean to use the word in any negative thing, just propaganda by its root word of to propagate. We have seeded this idea and we want you, when we, when we say to Mormon youth or even Mormon missionaries or even Mormon adults, when you think about the translation, you could have heard about the rock and the hat all you'd like and you can hear about the breastplate and the Urim and Thummim, but the church has with Sea Dog, Say Dog, with, this, with these mind maps, they have created a very, very concrete, repetitive image of a man sitting in front of the gold plates, translating with his human eyes, which we know through multiple different accounts and multiple different places is not correct. So my question is, why? Why are, uh, uh, the question is, with the Garden of Gethsemane and the Garden of Eden, we have hundreds of different interpretations that allow us to find our faith in the gray area. We have all of these visual literacies that allow us to find our understanding in the nexus in between the images and to allow us to grow. But if we can control the narrative, if we're the only people posting on Facebook, if we're the only ones with the Instagram password, we can control the narrative a lot more uh, resolutely. Again, nothing here nefarious, but it's important to understand that when the church releases a picture of Christ in Gethsemane, that isn't necessarily a depiction of the scripture. And when, he, when it depicts the first vision, that's also not necessarily a depiction of the account. And when it, uh, when it depicts the translation of the Book of Mormon, that is not necessarily a depiction of the actual historical event. Back to photojournalism at the top. This man lost his career and lost his livelihood because he decided to remove one element that was not important to the story from the story because to change the narrative even slightly is a bit unethical. Now, again, I, I'm not here to talk about the ethics of it, but it's remarkably important to recognize that this is something that is being done over and over and over, specifically in LDS uh, paintings and curated images. The pictures they choose to release tell a very, very singular story, which you could argue is good, that they're telling a, a solid brand story, that there is a, a solid narrative. But when their words don't match, when their uh, verbal canon don't match their visual canon, if you are one of those that believes that the, the pictures are inspired and therefore are scripture, we have to start having a lot of visual literacy to understand that gray area, that difference between the two. And there's a lot of higher reasoning, a lot of rationality, a lot of mental gymnastics we can do to make that make sense. But it's important to not just gloss over it and recognize that these are artistic renderings and not photojournalism. Hey, and I, I want to um, just make a quick statement about at the end of all of this, when we're looking at these images, when we're recognizing how we're being affected by that, not only in the way that we relate to our faith, but also the way that we understand how the rest of the world works and how this compares to what we know outside. Um, this process of looking, analyzing, and responding is not a process that we should be a slave to. 
I hear too many stories about people who get completely overwhelmed by the news, by social media, by all of these things, because the images are so heavily effective. Images and stories and just endless amounts of information coming to us, being able to look at these images, understand what they are communicating, how they are communicating, and how that communication is affecting us is going to put us in a position to be able to formulate stronger, healthier responses to these images. Uh, it's important to ask these critical questions because we want to know what is being revealed to or what is being kept from the viewer. Absolutely. I mean, I think we've all and maybe it's just me because of what I do for a living, but I think we've all seen a picture in the news and heard the byline and heard the headline and heard the story. And we're like, but that picture was from three years ago and is like it. Sometimes we can use images and contexts a little dishonestly. And again, I am talking about current American media. I'm not talking about the church. I'm saying that, but this is a skill and a tool that is, that is very effective using an image of one thing while describing it in a different way, your brain is going to actually erase the discrepancies in a lot of the cases. If you are not, uh, as Juniper said, if you don't let yourself be a slave to it, we should always be looking at these images and say, okay, what is this image revealing? And what is it excluding? What more to the story was there? What else was there? And even if you wanna stick with the picture as the picture itself, what is happening in this moment? Why did the artist choose this moment? Why did the church choose this moment? Why is this the most image, like why is this the most important image of Joseph Smith? In almost all of them, his head is to his hand, uh, his head is to his hand, or I guess not all, it, those top two. In many of them, you know, he's wearing the brown vest. It is in so many ways, it is a, a retelling of that same story. I mean, can we bear our testimony that we know for a fact he was wearing a vest? And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying that we have these images that start to tell this story over and over. And some of the details don't matter. He was wearing a vest because it was the common thing of the time, probably. He was wearing a white shirt because that was just what they wore. He was in a darkly lit room because of, there's a lot of things that are very quick and easy, but there's a lot of parts that just like we can sit and read the scriptures and read the footnotes and cross-reference over and over, visual literacy is no less complex. If anything, it's more complex because there are decisions. Why is this the moment chosen? Why is that the light chosen? Why is that the facial expression chosen? And not just by the artist, but by the church who, and why is it the same image over and over? Why, unlike the Garden of Eden and unlike the Garden of Gethsemane, why is there so little deviation uh, from the church narrative in this moment, which we actually know there was great deviation from. I want to, uh, I mean, at this point, we just can kind of open it up to be like a conversation and Juniper and I can just keep kind of talking about, there's so much more to unpack. We kind of rushed through it because an hour or 45 minutes just isn't enough to really like, I have a master's degree in this stuff. Juniper has, is getting, like, we have, we have been doing this stuff for 20, 10, 15 years each. There's so much to unpack, but it's an important thing to recognize that visuals affect us. Even if you're not a visual learner, visuals affect us so much more integrally than we think. And especially when we see repetitive images and repetitive stories through the course of a narrative, there is so much more power there than people inherently realize. I, I love that you're this statement that you're making because it is truly reminding me that when I'm walking through an art museum, the things that they tell you are who the artist was. They are telling you what the painting was for. They tell you what it was commissioned for. So you're getting this little bit of um, behind the scenes yeah. of understanding what went into creating the image itself, not only the medium or what you know about the artist, but moving even further into the why of this image even being created. I have created many images um, for commissions for my clients where 
I strive to understand deeply where they are coming from to, in order to create the most authentic and real image that's going to speak to them. And in terms of the church setting their standards for what they have determined is what they want to spread to millions of people, when the art stops being about one person getting this one artist to create an image that's going to mean something to them and we start talking about decisions being made for millions of people and what part of the story is being focused on um and and not showing all sides of this story is when we need to start making asking more of these questions and you know what's something because i unlike you i'm not an art historian i'm just a visual storyteller uh, what I learned very recently, like in the last five years, I just because art history was not my thing, I grew up seeing all these pictures of, you know, uh, of fig leaves and modest cherubs. And I did not know until very recently that that's not how they were painted. That was much later that they went in and the great modesting of the Sistine Chapel when they and 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 the Vatican where they went through and removed much of the nudity because of newer sensibilities. They, in essence, they rewrote history. They rewrote past sensibilities, all because of a new sense of propriety, not an antiquity sense of propriety. Not they changed the image for their modern sensibility. And again, back to my photojournalism story that matters, <laughs> that changing a small thing. I mean, did we need to see all of the genitalia? No, but that's not the point. The point isn't whether they removed something important. The point is that they changed the story on purpose. What's important is that they have a lot of information about the change and about the time period and about where it came from, where we are now and how the past affects the future and what's changing. I think what is a little bit different when we're looking at LDS religious iconography is that it stops being about what the commission was for, what the church wants you to see in it. And it begins being used as a, a, a literal representation. To that point, actually, it's really funny. So when Juniper and I were, were creating this, um, you know, we were going and getting all our citations because we wanted to credit all of the art and make sure that we were being as, as above board as possible. Um, it's really crazy. Like she just said, I don't know off the top of my head, but you can look up the name of the Pope that commissioned the adding all the fig leaves. You can look up the year. You can look up that whole story is out. That is not a hidden or secretive story. Like they were painted this way. They were changed this way at this point for this reason. When we were looking at the Harry Anderson, specifically the Christ in Gethsemane, there is no, we, I, I checked like 15 different websites. I can't find a year other than to say the mid sixties. Harry Anderson was commissioned in the mid sixties to make several images for the church. What they commissioned, what their requirements were, why he painted those images, if their, their directions, their descriptions, none of that. Unlike when I walked through the National Gallery of Art, which is in my backyard, and like you said, who commissioned it, where they commissioned it, why they commissioned it, who it was by. Like, there's so much context. If I want the LDS version, I can get Harry Anderson, mid 60s, Del Parson, 70 ish. Like, so much of the why has been removed. And it's really easy to go, well, because the why doesn't matter. It's a pretty picture of Jesus. And that's fair. But in visual literacy, <laughs> in visual literacy, the why absolutely matters. The context absolutely matters. And if it doesn't, that great more greatly implies the scripture concept. The why doesn't matter because this was an inspired work and it was a commissioned work and it should be seen as scripture. The when and the why and the description and the conversation and the collaboration, none of that matters because it was an inspired work and therefore should be treated as scripture. I am not saying the church says that about their images. I'm not saying they don't say it. I'm just saying that by removing the context, it more greatly adds weight to its infallibility because it removes that human element. I know who paints, I, I can look up who painted the fig leaves on the angels. I don't know the conversation that happened between Harry Anderson and why the picture is depicted the way that it was like I can with Michelangelo why so much of this presentation has been so much speculation. There is so little information about why the works look 
that they do. And there are infinite numbers of images that we could have pulled up. There is every single image that is in church buildings across the country that we could have gone through. And we could have talked about how it tells a story of something that isn't what we're reading, or it is telling, um, it is affecting the mind in a way, and it is meant to affect the mind in a way that we are not always aware of. Uh, you know, absolutely. I think that there are, you know, and we, we talked about this in creating it and just, there are images that we could have done whole hour presentations between the two of us on, on a single image uh, or a single movement or a single era, because this is such an important and weighty concept. Visual literacy is another language. It's, you are bilingual, whether or not, I mean, whether or not you speak two or three or four language, visual literacy is an in and of itself, its own language with abilities to evoke different emotions passively. You can look at a picture that, that is stirring, is happy, is joyful. And a lot of those go straight, as I've said several times to the limbic system, they evoke emotions and responses without the rational mind's consent. They just do those things. So as we, so these choices are very heavy choices and artist depictions are great and wonderful. And, and I'm an artist myself. I love to depict things as I see them, but when you remove the context, it becomes a lot more uh, weighty of where this picture came from, especially when it's released by an organization like the church who claims a certain degree of infallibility. Exactly. Um, so would yeah, you guys like to take questions. a couple questions? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Okay. So Rob Lauer asked, as a Mormon creative myself, I think the institutional LDS church values graphics and imagery only as propaganda, not as art that inspires contemplation or has aesthetic, aesthetic value. Sorry. You used the word brand a few moments ago. What are your thoughts on the church commissioned art as marketing for a brand? So this is where I could do five hours on this question. So I'm going to be very careful in not doing that because I have nine minutes. But I will say that one of my biggest pain points a few years ago was when the, the church uh, changed its official name and said, you know, don't call us the Mormon church, call us the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this isn't rebranding. That's BS. It's absolutely rebranding. And to, to try to change the definition of a word for your own rebranding is propaganda at its core level. You're trying to change how someone reviews, because the word branding, much like the word propaganda, has some nuance and some, some negativity to it. I will say that watching the church as a marketing entity, and I am, I am not trying to be negative at all. I work in branding. I love branding. But, but if you look at the church as an act of branding, you can watch their eras. We had the family. Isn't it about time. We had the, and I'm a Mormon campaign. We've had campaigns. We've had definitive, definitive uh, movements towards brands. And I don't mean that as a negative thing. Again, your Facebook depicts you as a personal brand. It just does. Um, the church has branding. I also agree with you that the church absolutely uses their art as propaganda. And again, I don't mean that in the negative World War II sense. I mean that they do it to propagate a very specific narrative. And they do it, in my opinion, with a little degree of unethicality towards the full picture by putting some blinders and some restrictions. That artist I showed at the beginning, J. Kirk Richards, he has very few, very few commissioned church works. And I couldn't find the blog when I was creating this, but he wrote in one of his blogs, it's because everything he's done for the church, they've rejected because it violated some of their rules. Like they have rules like the savior shall, can never be in shadow. And they have, they have a bunch of different rules that make it so that the, the savior as depicted by LDS works fit within a branding guideline or a style guideline. I create these for my clients all the time. Like these are the colors you will use. These are the images you will use. These are the races you will use. The, the church absolutely does that. And if I had to be really honest, I say they do it a little dishonestly because they claim to not be doing it by saying things like, well, this isn't a rebrand. Yes, it is. It's the definition of a rebrand. You are wanting to change how people think about you. And you can add as much scripture to it and as much meaning behind it and as much, uh, you know, truly deeply felt. But there are, there are corporations that have gone through very important, deeply emotionally held rebrands. A rebrand is not a negative thing. 
the church went through a rebrand. And I think the biggest negative thing they did was claim that it wasn't one. They tried to make it act like it was something else. No, it was a rebrand. And so back to your actual question, again, I could go on for hours on this subject, um, is that yes, the church absolutely uses its, it uses its visual literacy as a form of propaganda. And it absolutely, I mean, all Mormon pictures look like all Mormon pictures. They absolutely have a visual style. They absolutely have a brand. And that is not a bad thing until they claim they don't have one. And then it yes. becomes a little iffy. I think it's interesting that uh, the person that asked this question is bringing up infographics because infographics are a very, very misleading so you have to understand where those numbers are coming from, what is going into those numbers. Um, who, who are they getting these numbers from? Understanding exactly what the stipulations should what the stipulations are on membership itself can become misleading when you are looking at infographics about church membership. So absolutely, those infographics are used to very quickly give you something that you can scan through. We're saving you time. Just look at this infographic. We'll tell you everything you need to know. We say it in the first paragraph of whatever we're doing at General Conference to give you a little insight of how well we're doing. And it's misleading. Um, infographics are meant to make a point. So when you are looking at an infographic from the church, understand where it's art. An infographic is art. What are they trying to communicate to you through this graphic? Uh, you know, 100%. I am not a visual, I'm not an infographic artist. I have a few that have worked for me throughout the past, but like in my master's program, I had to take a class on, on infographics and visual information depiction. And I will say there is like, most dishonest. I took a class in PR and propaganda and infographics far more dishonest because I can make, you can make someone think anything you want with it, with numbers that say anything you want. If you just make a pie chart, that's pretty enough. Yeah. Oh, did we have another question? We do. We have a few others. So oh, great. Um, let's, let's, let's power through. Okay. Yeah. So we have four minutes left. I'm going to ask okay. this one. It says, what can you tell us about how the church interacts with commissioned artists? Is all art or church art, excuse me, commissioned? So all church art should, I believe I should be correct in stating that all church art comes from the church approaching an artist and having a discussion and or artists submitting their work to the church and it being rejected. Those are gonna be the two ways that clients and um, artists come together. So, so that, yeah. go ahead. The, real, real quick, cause I wanna get to the uh, really, really fast. So yes, if it is hanging in a temple or in a church building, it has either been purchased by or commissioned by that, or it is in a church book. Uh, that is not true. If you go to a Deseret book, Seagull book, uh, you know, Deseret, yes. But uh, sorry, I mean, if you go to the church distribution, yes. But if you go to a, a you know, uh, a church bookstore, you know, that that is a privately held business and they can sell some other things. They tend not to stray too far. Um, Again, I was trying to find the J. Kirk Richards thing. He's the only artist that I know that has ever actually worked and has released those standards. But yes, there's a very set, uh, set list of standards of the church has for their art, and it's remarkably limiting. I can't speak to it because I've never gone through that process. But uh, read J. Kirk Richards' blog. I couldn't find it when I was creating this, but I have read it in the past, and I, I can't do better than that today. Sorry. Great answer. Thank you. Um, next one. Are there any known church-approved images of Joseph using the hat? Not that I know of. Interesting. I have seen renditions of it that were for, like, I have seen renditions that have been done by LDS author, uh, LDS artists, but none that I am aware of that are LDS approved. You could get them in, in, in a, like, that is, uh, the closest I can get is that uh, M. Russell Nelson did a uh, kind of like short video a few years ago of him talking about it and he was holding a hat and he was, he was discussing it as to not suppress the idea, which is great. It's good to, to bring that up. But as far as visual representations as commissioned by the church, not that I know of. Okay. So we got two minutes left and there's two questions. Great, Wait. we can do this. Okay, one, what are your thoughts on the depiction of Jesus Christ as a white male? Could this be a contributing factor to the racism that exists in Mormon communities across the spectrum? Now, you wanna talk about something I can talk about for five hours. Um, <laughs> There is a reason that we um, we avoided this topic, but not to not because we don't have opinions on it, but because 
absolutely. There is a certain level of awareness that went into this creation of and depiction of Christ. Now the argument can be made that perhaps this depiction of Christ as a white man is, you know, representative of what the vast, vast majority of the LDS uh, congregation looks like. So perhaps this is a means of creating an image that is more relatable to your audience. But again, this becomes extremely problematic when you know historically what the, what the truth was, what like we know that Jesus Christ was not a white man. And it also pushes us into a position where we are we are now looking at an image and elevating a white man as our image of Christ. And so I could talk it about kind this of goes for, yeah. places. I could talk about this for hours as well, but I think that was a great answer. I want to get to this last question with our last minute. Okay. What's our last okay. question? The last question, sorry. Um, can you explain how color changes the story, like the brown vest or the blues and greens in the Garden of Gethsemane? Wow. So for this one, I will just say literally, uh, because I, I don't have five hours right now, uh, Google branding color, and you will see charts. Uh, there's a reason that Burger King uses, uh, that Burger King, McDonald's, Hardee's, and every other major uh, fast food uses yellow and red. Yellow and red excites you and makes you hungry. There's a reason that every single airline uses cool blues, uh, Delta, American, United, all of them. Southwest is the outlier there. There is a reason that colors evoke emotional response 100% of the time, and it is actually measurable and repeatable. And so Christ in Gethsemane being blues and greens means something. Christ in Gethsemane, where, uh, Christ wearing a red robe and the color of that red means something. The color theory is one of my most deeply held things. I can literally talk to you about it for hours, but the fastest type infographic, like brand colors, and you will see a chart um, colors do things to your cerebral cortex and it is measurable. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are at time. Um, I will note that there is another question out there. So maybe you two could get on the app and, and address some of these that you would like to expand on and answer that last question. Um, thank you very much for attending this session and for your time and putting this presentation together. Have a great day. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you.